All right. So before we get started, uh, a few administrative things. So the homework four has been posted. Um, so that'll be due next Wednesday as usual, week and a half to work on it. Um, okay, so for the rest of the quarter, uh, on Friday, unfortunately I have to be out of town, so I won't be able to hold office hours. So if anyone wants to meet with me, um, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to arrange a separate meeting. Uh, next Monday, don't forget that is a holiday, so we won't have class, uh, which means that we basically have uh, three classes left, including today. Um, and then the week after that, uh, which is the week of June 5th, uh, I have to be traveling again. That's when you guys, um, I'm traveling on Monday. That's when you guys are doing your final presentations. So the presentations for everyone are gonna be due on Monday at class time, just so that everyone has sort of an equal amount of time to work on it. Uh, and then we'll do Monday presentations will be online. Uh, and then Wednesday will be back in person. That'll be our, our last class, okay? Um, and I'll post all of these details in an announcement uh, on Canvas. So the Monday is online? Yeah. You have to be there on Monday as well? Yes, but I will be, uh, on, I will be yeah, on the Zoom call. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, sorry for the inconvenience. That is the yeah, trouble of having multiple. <laughs> Multiple jobs, I guess. Okay. Um, I know that last week we had done the pre-recorded sessions. So if there's anything that folks were confused about or want to go over or have any questions, happy to chat about that right now. Um, everyone get all the stuff about the nonlinear models, right? All right. I can give you guys like a pop quiz right now and it'll all be good. Yes. Um, for the GAM fit, yes. you said that that should be like kind of the first step we get to, to see what data, how does the data, how do different elements of the data uh, regress on what your specific variable is working at. So that's like the first step and then from there you kind of hone in on the, the pieces of data that Assess further and then apply the correct model, whether it be linear or, or something else. Right? Yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's like the first step that you should think about, but especially if you're doing like a linear model, mm -hmm. the GAM is really helpful with respect to testing the assumption of linearity, right? In a linear model, basically, we assume that the relationship between the parameters and your outcome are in a linear form. Like I can transform the input, but whatever that transformation is, it should be linear with my outcome. And if it's not, then you're introducing sort of bias in the model. So the idea with the GAM is even if you are just doing a linear model, it's a good thing to check your the relationship between any individual input and your output. And if it's not a straight line, then you may want to think about some kind of transformation of your data to make it a straight line. Or you can like caveat your results and say that like, it's probably not the, you know, most linear fit. Does that, does, does everyone know what we're, we're talking about here? Right, uh, last time. He saw like if I have y equals beta one x one plus beta two x two, like if this was just a linear model, then you have some kind of relationship x one to y that looks like this, and then you have some relationship x two versus y, um, which looks like this, and that that is like a fundamental built-in like part of 
how the linear regression works, right? It just assumes that the relationship is linear. But if we do this thing, right, where, okay, I'll just like use some kind of pseudo thing, code here, right? So this is our gam fit. Then uh, instead, Instead, what we end up with, you could have something that looks more like that uh, or that or whatever it is, right? And so if, it, if the shape of the line looks like that in your, in your GAM fit, um, you might not want to do just like a simple linear fit. So this is a really good way of testing the functional form uh, of your uh, of your, of the relationship in the data between your x's and your y's. Okay. Yes. For this point, in all of the examples, we have equidistant breakpoints. Is it common to have breakpoints at different distances? Yeah. Um, Actually, that's like one of the really nice things about the spline. So, so yes, you can you can specify different breakpoints. Um, and one of the n really nice things about the splines, though, is that the like cubic part of that function means that even if your breakpoints aren't like perfect, even if they're in weird spots, like you can manipulate the line usually enough that it would sign it, kind of cover that. So you could end up with the same. You could end up with the same fit or a very similar fit, even if my breakpoints were like here and here versus like here and here, right? Because it, it just means that the like curve of your cubic function is, is different, if that makes sense. Um, so short answer, yes, you can put them in different breakpoints, but, um, but generally if your breakpoints aren't like perfectly calibrated to the data, it's usually OK. Yeah. OK. Oh, yes. When you think about the piecewise mm -hmm. linear fit, um, what's the correct application of that approach for your just meant to be like help you. No, yeah, don't. Don't think about like that. Like the, the polynomial regression and the piecewise regression are stepping stones to do splines. Um, and so I introduce those concepts as sort of building blocks so that we can understand what a spline is. Okay. But in practice, nobody does, well, I'm not going to say nobody, but Someone it's, it's a fairly rare thing that you would do piecewise linear regression. I mean, there are like some examples of this if you have like very particular nuanced data that it makes sense to do this piecewise regression. Okay. But yeah, I mean, the proper way to do it like if you had to do it would be, um, actually, what do you think? What do you guys think? What do I always ask when I ask <laughs> the question? Cross yeah, you could choose breakpoints in your piecewise regression based off of some like, you could like randomly choose breakpoints until you get stuff that's like, that gives you the best predictive ability that's how I would do it, I guess, if I had to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and maybe you said it's kind of where I was going, but with the breakpoints, I can imagine a situation where you have a whole bunch of data, and like you're trying to identify the point at which like the re like the relationship may like change, right? So like I'm thinking of it in my mind like a very simple thing with like a step a step function. This, and at this point it goes up, and 
across the yes. network. But the data could be something, it wouldn't be as clear. Yeah. And so you, you, you can maybe use a piecewise map yes. to find that kind of like break point that's not overtly obvious. Yes. Uh, or you could have the splines find it for or you. Or you could have the splines find it for you. Yes. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, if you want to think of it as a video game, all the power to you. Um, yeah. Okay. So hopefully you guys uh, get a decent sense of like this very like pretty strong departure from what we're doing in terms of doing these like more parametric models, right? Where you have these coefficients and you can interpret them. Whereas with the splines, you don't have the ability to do interpretation, but it has much better ability to do prediction. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of the trade-off between a lot of what we've talked about earlier in class with like linear and logistic regression and what we were talking about over the last week with these like uh, more uh, fluid functional forms. So in an analogous way, um, where we went from linear regression to logistic, right? And so, what's so? What is the big difference between those two? Linear versus logistic. Why do we do one versus the other? Yes. Yes, not just binary, but yes, categorical. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to think about moving from these non-parametric um, models that focus on continuous outcomes to um, like classifier models, classification models where we are looking at Ys that are based off of some kind of category and doing the kind of, it's not a spline version, but the analogy of that um, for these models. Okay. So, let's jump into it. All right, I've got a plot of x1 and x2 and a random post-it for some reason, okay, x1 and x2. So these are my two explanatory variables. And then let's say that my outcome variable can take on to either of two values. It can either be a red X or a blue circle. And I can actually um, look at this and separate it in space, right? And so if I had some kind of line here, so this is going to be known as a hyperplane. OK, a hyperplane, just so we have the formal definition, a flat affine subspace of dimension p minus 1 in p dimensional space. OK, so that just means in a 2D space, it's a line. If it were in a 3D space, right, it would be a plane that cuts through everything. Um, so in, intuitively, hopefully, we, we understand this idea, right, more than the sort of definition. Um, and thinking about this from like a data analysis perspective, right? If I have some way of creating this line, I can use that line 
in order to separate these categories and determine if I wanted to predict, for example, something that was below the line, I would say that it's red, and then if it, if it was above the line, I would say it's blue, okay? So this would equate to, you know, something like this in two dimensions. And this can be generically written in p dimensions, you know, beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 uh, plus uh, beta p xp equals 0. So this would be in p dimensions. Okay. So, this is kind of the concept that we're going to be working with today and thinking about how we can do this and getting a little bit more complicated in our examples and the flexibility of this, constructing this line. Actually, I'll just make a new board. Okay. So one, the first one that we're going to look at is called a maximal margin classifier. Uh, and so this is also known as an optimal separating hyperplane. So essentially what this does is separating, separating hyperplane that is farthest from training observations. Okay, so let's take a look at our example again or something similar to our example. I'm just going to draw some points. And something like this. Oops. Okay, so one problem of sort of drawing this line is that in actuality, so that is a hyperplane that separates all of the points of data, but so is that, so is that, and that, right? And so there are an infinite number of separating hyperplanes. So how do we decide on a particular line? Are there any sort of rules that we might be able to enforce to, to figure out one particular line? Could you yeah. Um, yeah, except that's not called a uh, mean squared error, but yes. Yeah, so in fact, if I were to draw a line here, I can look at the distance from each point to my line 
something like this. Okay. So this distance is known as, or this line is known as a support vector. So it turns out that actually what we want to do in this case is, isn't to, um, it isn't to, to decrease the distance, it's actually to maximize the distance. You want the support vector to be as large as possible for all points. And so why is that? So I think, yeah. Line is perfectly in between. Yeah, exactly. So we think of these as, if you think of these lines as sort of like pillars to support um, to support the line, um, your, to support the hyperplane, uh, sort of maximizing the distance ensures, right, that actually as you push in one direction or the other, you, you are giving sort of equidistant weighting to both sides. Yeah, and so generally what we want to do is maximize this distance. And so doing this particular procedure solves this problem where maybe I had an infinite number of hyperplanes before, but there exists only one hyperplane that will maximize the distance to all of these points. Okay, and so the equation for this looks something like this. Maximize with respect to all of your variables here. M uh, such that the sum of J equals one to P beta j squared equals one. And so this will give you something that looks like this. Okay, so if you were to plug in your data um, into this sort of optimization, it'll solve for you all of these betas, which tell you, you know, the slopes of your, of your separating lines um, such that your distance is uh, maximized to the, um, to that hyperplane. Okay. So this is kind of similar. Oh, yeah. So the response variable is a categorical blue or red? Yes, that's right. And this, uh, so imagine in the case of two variables, you would have a beta one and beta two, which, um, which help you define the hyperplane in, in two dimensions. Uh, and then you can, it's hard to visualize, but you can go on uh, to do this for as many um, variables as, as you want. Okay, so there's two really big issues um, with the maximum margin classifier. So one of them is maybe a little bit nuanced, but what's the obvious one? 
Yes. You actually don't need an equal number of points, right? You can have, you, I could have one red X on one side and it would be fine. You would still be able to define a hyperplane that separates them, right? So can you think of an example where I wouldn't be able to draw a hyperplane to separate all the points? Like if I had this. Except to way more of an extreme. But like. Yeah. Even just one. This is now an unsolvable right. problem in maximum, for a maximum margin classifier, right? Like there exists no line that can s absolutely separate both points, right? Um, and so that is the most common issue. So when I have x2, x1, if I have points that are like this, This is known as a non-separable case. And this is very common. There exists no hyperplane that I can draw in any form that would be able to divide the data into two classifying groups. Yeah. I thought you were going to volunteer to draw, try and draw a straight line. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, no I, I, I was going to ask, is there a process by which, like, would you classify, like, the, 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 the x, the red x on the, like, the furthest left on the x1 axis, like, well, we're going to figure out, we're going to see how we deal with this in a second, okay. But just for the purposes of this particular example, it can't, you can't do anything about it in a maximum margin classifier. Okay. Um... So here, I'm going to draw a line maybe that looks like this. Uh, okay, maybe there, that's better. So this is attempting to maximize my support vector, right? So the problem is that if I were to add a single point here, what you'll see is that suddenly my line has to shift quite a bit, right? In order to accommodate for this um, single point. And so, the MMC, the maximum margin classifier, is highly sensitive to individual observations. So because the hyperplane has to accommodate every piece of data and has to properly separate any individual piece of data, um, adding single points into your data if they are at the boundary can drastically shift the classifier, okay? And so that's another sort of, I'm not gonna say drawback, but that's a feature of this type of um, model. Yes? 
Mm -hmm. um, and now you clear them how we activate, assuming those X, all X, are not correlated. Like they are entirely separate from each other. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think that it's similar to like a linear regression in the sense that like they, you're always going to have some level of correlation. You probably don't want things that are like completely or like very, very highly correlated. Um, otherwise, I think you'll run into the same like multicollinear, multicollinearity issues that you would in a linear regression, right? You're going to have a hard time distinguishing, like if X1 and X2 are both very, very similar, you're going to have a hard time distinguishing whether the effect is coming specifically from X1 or specifically from, from X2. Mm -hmm. If their individual, oh, if their um, hyperline is identified as highly sensitive to individual observation, then it seems like those X1 and X2 cannot be overlapping anyway, um, but based on where the hyperline. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, if they were highly correlated, um, the points would probably be show some kind of pattern, right? Where you would go from like, uh, it would probably be some kind of line of some kind. So that, that, that's what it would mean if they were highly correlated. But then uh, this idea, right, is somewhat related to this in that the hyperplane um, uh, relies on every sort of data point being separable and, and thus when you have observations that like move the classifier a lot, um, that can be problematic, or you could have um, just, you know, this, this case, yeah. Okay. So what do we do? We think about a slightly modified approach. So this is known as a support vector classifier. And what I'll say uh, about these models that I'm presenting is kind of analogous to what I was doing before with the like uh, last week with the polynomial regression and the piecewise linear regression. These classifiers are helping us build up to um, the final model. It's called a support vector machine. Um, which is more commonly used. The uh, MMC, maximum, mar um, maximum Margin Classifier, and this one, the Support Vector Classifier, are sort of less commonly used. So this is better because it has general robustness to individual observations um, and better classification of most training observations. So it actually uses the same optimization as MMC, but additional constraints. So, so it still has the maximize um, my classifier, but it's got this additional constraint, epsilon is greater than zero, um, where sum i equals one, and epsilon is less than or equal to C, where C is our tuning parameter. Mm -hmm. 
And so what does this look like? Almost the same. Except here we add a term at the end, 1 minus epsilon i. So this is known as our slack variable. OK, so what is going on here? This is saying epsilon i is a term that we're introducing uh, as part of the constraint that lets us add flexibility into the model. So how many points? can violate the margin. And C uh, is the bounds, uh, it bounds the number for our epsilons. So this is our budget for violations. at c equals 0. OK, so who can tell me what would it mean if c equals 0? Mm -hmm. Yep, which means that this model would look like what? Yes. So at c equals 0, it is same as mmc. Right? So all this does is it says if I were to jump back to here. If we look at our non-separable case, um, let's say, let's do this. Let's actually get rid of these guys. So in our non-separable case, we cannot draw a line that would separate all the points. Um, but in the support vector classifier, I can say if I set c equals to 1, it says, OK, you're allowed to essentially violate my classifier with one point. And so with, with c equals 1, then I could draw a line that looks like this. right? Um, and it would be OK that this violates it. And in fact, you could even do, like, you could have a budget of two, and maybe it would draw a line like here, and it would violate two things, but it would do so in a way that the classifier is, um, the support vectors are more maximized, right? And so the support vector classifier lets us get around non separable cases when we give it enough slack to sort of ignore the fact that you might have uh, individual points located on one side of the hyperplane that it, I guess, that it shouldn't be. Makes sense? Yeah, and so maybe just to emphasize the point before, like if you had c equals 1, Oop. Maybe that would look something like this. Um, and let's say you had another point that was like right here. Um, 
With the support vector classifier, if you ignore one point, it would draw a line probably that looks like this, right? Ignoring that one red X. But if you let it draw, uh, if you let it have two points as slack, maybe it would do something like this, getting rid of these two, not getting rid of, but sort of ignoring um, the effect of those two uh, because that line does a um, larger distance from my support vectors. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? So I was wondering if we could find the Yes. So, great question. So the idea, basically what you're asking is, uh, with the support vector classifier, I can change my budget um, to, um, to, to, modify the, to, to modify the classifier. And essentially what your question is boiling down to is, how do I know which is the best classifier, right? You have a, like a valid maximum distance or also accommodate the yes. observation, not there. <laughs> so, what is, so what is the answer to that? Cross-validation, yeah. Right, so you can do the same thing, leave out points, put down a classifier, Decide on your budget based off of your training and test sample and seeing which one has the sort of best classification, right? Lowest error rate. And, and it could be a total error rate. So getting the most blues as blues and reds as reds. You could also be the best false or the lowest false positive, the lowest false negative rate. So getting red predictions as more important than blue predictions or getting blue predictions as more important than, than red predictions, right? So we can also decide on the classifier that, that does that the best, okay? Okay. Issues with support Vector classifier must be a linear separator. Okay. So the last one that we'll talk about is the support vector machine, which will sort of directly address the, that last shortcoming, um, that the hyperplane has to be a straight line. So how could we do this? So we could allow for polynomial expansion or interactions of x's, right? So this is increasing your degrees of freedom. It allows your line to no longer be straight. Um, but in practice, this explodes in size very quickly. So instead, 
we can modify and generalize computation of the support vector classifier. So if you think about what the vector classifier is doing, as you draw a hyperplane, it's essentially looking at points that are nearby, right? So are there examples that we have looked at uh, where we're visually sort of considering at any given point kind of what's happening in the neighborhood? So K nearest neighbors was one of them. And then does anyone recall one from a very recent lecture, maybe from last class? Um, yeah, so I would say that the spline, um, the spline still considers sort of all of the points in, in the data as it makes the, the shape. But is there something that cares specifically about points that are close by? That's part of the splines. Um, so what is the alternative to doing splines for non-parametric? Kernels, yes, that's the one. So right, uh, kernels are like, you have this bandwidth that says, think specifically about points that are really close by, and as the bandwidth increases, it starts to like make look at points that are far away, right, if you remember from the, from the lecture. Um, and so you can do the same thing here, and, and in fact, the support vector classifier is a kernel. Uh, the SVC uses a linear kernel, right? Um, and we know that because if I jump back to here really quick. OK. What happens to my hyperplane if I do this? So if I take this point, um, if I get rid of this point, what happens to my hyperplane? Uh, no, actually nothing. So essentially, um, the, the pillars aren't actually changing in, in length. Right for for points that are farther away, it only cares about the ones that are like um, on the on the border, right? So you could have a bunch. I could have a bunch of red points here, and I could get rid of all of them, and nothing would happen. So the idea is in the support vector machine. Um, Instead of this idea that you have these sort of single pillars that are drawing a straight line, the SVM can employ more complex kernels. So the common ones are polynomial kernels and radial kernels. 
Okay. So the math behind SVMs gets uh, really complicated very quickly, but I think that we can look at examples of this, practical examples of this, so that you guys can have an idea of how you would set these up and, and what these would es essentially do, okay? So I'm gonna jump back over to R and we're gonna implement a couple um, a couple examples. Okay, so stop mirroring. Okay. So hopefully this is all still working. We're going to load in a couple libraries. Um, you guys have seen all of these before, except for E1071, um, which is a package that contains um, the SVM function, which is how we are uh, running our support vector machines. OK. So let's go ahead and run these guys here. Whoa, what happened? Uh, okay, great. So here I actually am going to set a seed um, so that we all, so if you're following along, we're, we'll be looking at the same thing. Otherwise, it could be really different. Um, so this will be our support vector classifier example. So X is a matrix. Oh, I should mention what the set seed actually does. Um, so whenever I do, oops. Whenever you use functions that do random draws, like R norm, um, then essentially the draws will always be the same if you're set to a particular seed. Okay, so this is a way to do a random draw, but then allow for everyone else to have the exact same random draws as, as me. And what was that? Oh, yeah, thank you. I was like, why is there an X there? Okay, there we go. Okay, our Y is going to be something like this. So if we take a look at what this looks like, we have um, 40 uh, random numbers, or 20 pairs. And those 20 pairs have a corresponding negative one or positive one, <coughs> indicating like a dummy variable or categorical variable for my outcome, OK? So if I just wanted to look at a quick, simple plot of this, 
So kind of like what we're looking at in the notes here, you've got blue points and red points um, indicating uh, two different values for my outcome. And the idea is that I want to try and figure out some kind of hyperplane, right, that would separate um, the blues and the reds. Uh, so if this were an MMC, would you be able to draw a hyperplane to separate these? No, right? Which means that for a support vector classifier, I need to add some budget to allow my classifier to um, to allow certain points to violate that classifier. Okay? So I'm going to change this into a data table. So that it's all the data is in one place. So if I were just to do this, um, I would have my x1, my x2, and my y, right? Oops. Up here. OK, so SVM fit dot linear. So it's just a support vector machine with a linear kernel, which is my support vector classifier. The way that I specify that is by using this kernel equals linear. And then uh, I have a budget of 10. So I'm actually allowing up to 10 points to be violating my classifier if I want. And let's take a look at what this model will tell us. So number of support vectors, so how many pillars you would actually need to construct to hold that line up. Okay. Uh, we have two classes, so just the red and the blue. Um, does it tell us anything else? Nope. The, the, the cost term is the, that is... The, the budget that you right. give for how many points are allowed to, up to how many, yeah, you can... In, in globally or from Globally, yeah. So you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell from which side, especially when you're looking at sort of more complicated data. Yeah, yeah and like if you have more than two classes, right? So actually, I'll make another point here, is that unlike our logistic regression, so this is an, very much analogous to our splines versus our linear regression. So with an SVM or SVC compared to a logistic regression, I don't have any coefficients or anything. So there's no like interpretability about like what that line physically represents. But I can do these sort of predic predictions, right? Once I have a hyperplane set, I can say everything below something I would predict as red, and everything above that hyperplane I would predict as blue. Um, so very much in the same vein, these are very powerful tools to do predictive ability, but not necessarily for inference. OK? Yeah. Okay, so this is the classification plot. Um, actually, if I press the back arrow, will it go to the previous? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So 
we can see generally uh, well it flipped it didn't it I think because it's I think v1 v2 so the plot is like rotated a little bit but when it draws the plane uh, Hopefully you guys can see there's like, there's these circle points like here. Okay. Um, so, there are um, X's in these plots that indicate that those are points that were, um, points that violate the classifier, but that we're allowing to do that because we've given it this budget of up to 10. And it has decided to do one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so the classifier that, uh, the classifier that maximizes uh, the distance <coughs> to the support vectors is the one where there's six violations. Okay. And you can imagine that if you were doing some like cross validation procedure, you would want the one that like predicts the best, right? And so, um, yeah, you can vary the cost uh, value based off of the cross validation to make sure that you're like not overfitting. This Yeah, that's right. So the best metric, because this is a model geared towards prediction, is probably the one that gives you the lowest error rate for out of sample predictions. That's what I would go with as a golden rule for calibrating your classifier. Okay. Any other questions about these classifiers? Actually, yes. The classifier be the, the, the cost. No, the classifier is the hyperplane. The hyperplane. So picking the best hyperplane, but that's based on cost. So then it's the, the out of sample error. Yeah. So the idea, right, just to reiterate, is um, if I took out this point, I could draw a line like here, right? Um, if I took out like these three points, maybe I could come up with like a different line. But the whole idea is dropping points to make that line have the maximum classifier in the sense that, you know, your support vectors are as large as possible. Um, that's what you're aiming to do, right? Okay, so now let's take a look at the support vector machine example. Um, oh, this actually requires another data set which I haven't posted yet, so you guys are not going to be able to follow along, but that's okay. Um, I will post this uh, later today. We have a file esl.mixture.rda. And if we look at this, um, 
it already contains the data that we want to uh, we want to look at. I'm going to remove my x's and y's that I used in the previous example so that I can uh, load them in from here. Okay, so what does this look like? Okay, way messier data, okay? So this is, we're trying to do the same thing. We want to come up with some kind of classifier, um, but these are highly non-separable, um, and you can see kind of how much they're sort of in, in, intermingled. So, I could come up with, you know, a large budget, which clearly I'd have to do, right, because whatever classifier that I draw, um, or most likely any classifier that I draw through these points is going to violate uh, a lot of, um, a lot of the points. But now there's this like two dimensional thing that I have to consider, which is now I'm, a, let's say I'm going to be allowed to draw a line in any shape. Um, but I'm also allowed to remove points. And so if I were just to ask you guys, um, what funky line could I draw through here and how many points could I remove to give me the best ability to predict like an out of sample sets of red or black points, right? Yeah. Something like kind of like it's from left to right. Okay, but like, who knows? Like, so you're saying, like, but it could be like this, it could be like this, yeah. right? Like, I don't know, right? It's very hard to be able to interpret this thing. And, and then you can imagine if I get into three dimensions or four dimensions or any number of dimensions, like my ability to visualize a hyperplane and balance all these things about like getting it exactly, uh, getting sort of the best predictions, that's, that's a very hard thing to do. But for an SVM, that's where it becomes very powerful, right? Um, that it can, it can figure out um, the sort of best line uh, or hyperplane to draw through these things that it's not even necessarily linear and how many points to remove to give us the best chance to reduce the errors in classifying any, any point, okay? So let's see what we can do here. Just going to put it all into one table. So this is going to use, unlike the previous example, instead of a linear kernel, a, a radial kernel. Um, and it has a different cost function. Um, sorry, I should mention, um, yeah, I, uh, I just realized. So the cost is not referring to, um, is not referring to the epsilon. Uh, it's referring to your um, your tuning parameter, uh, and so it's going to allow for. Um, it's like a it's a scale that's the the smaller it is, the less number of violations you have, and the larger it is, the more that you can have but it's not the actual exact number, because this will be doing more than five. OK. So if I run this, uh, what did I do? Oh. So 
here, the data contains 200 observations, and there's 103 pillars. Um, so a lot more. But this isn't really telling you much else. So let's look at the plot. And let's actually look at a bigger picture here. Um, yeah, uh, that's just a form of like, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, it, it's the actual classifier is going to look smoother than this. Yeah. It's um, the way that it does the plotting and the increments. Um, okay. So from this particular model, uh, you can see that there are, you know, a fairly large number of uh, violations that we've allowed it to have in the budget. And, and in, in allowing it to do that, um, it is constructing this uh, in a certain way, right? And so this is a very nonlinear sort of hyperplane um, moving through all of these points. Uh, and this is what it deems as kind of the best fit. Um, in order to make sure you're sort of uh, making your support vector as large as possible. Okay. So this is a pretty powerful non-parametric tool that'll let us think about doing predictions on classifying um, outcomes in you know a fairly strategic way. Uh, and what I'll say about these types of models is that these are going to almost, yeah, I would, I would say uh, with very high frequency, these will totally blow away a lot of like logistic regression type approaches on more complex uh, sets of data, right? Because it can be totally flexible in the way that you are um, sort of building these hyperplanes and separating them into classifiers, right? With a logistic regression, it has to be a straight line, okay? Um, and, in, and in this case, my ability to do prediction is not confined in, in the same way. You do need to make sure that you are doing like a good sort of cross-validation procedure in order to make sure you're not like overfitting, because that is uh, something that you can do pretty easily with this type of model, yeah. So with the reduced regression, the ability to do inference is a lot better? Yes. So there is no inferential ability at all yeah. in, so like in if here. So just strictly care about classification, SVM is a lot better. Yes, exactly. So you're more interested in interpreting something. Yeah. In, in, the, in the exact same way that with a spline or a kernel regression, you're all, unless the functional form is truly linear, you will always do better in predicting outcomes than with a linear regression, exactly. Um, yeah, and you can like mess around with the cost function to see how this changes. We can try that. I haven't actually tested this, but let's see what happens. Yeah, so you can have <laughs> uh, it's not actually, I don't think it's actually an island. Um, I don't think that's actually allowed uh, because it's an affine function. Um, so it's probably connected like this somehow. Uh, and I could do a really small cost. And I believe this will start to look a little bit more. Well, Try this. Yeah. So it should start to 
warp to become more and more linear at a certain point. You might have to get really small, but yeah. Okay, so that is examples of um, non-parametric classifier models uh, that you can use um, for for examples where your outcome variable is uh, is categorical. Um, okay. So at this point, let's see how much time do we have left. Okay. Um, I will maybe poll you guys. We've covered a lot of the sort of fundamentals in the areas of like non-parametric. Um, this is kind of with the, with the splines, the kernels, and support vector uh, approaches. That's kind of like building blocks to get into a lot more um, of the like non-parametric world, which is mainly focused on prediction. But we can also do a little bit more on sort of inference. Um, and so maybe based off of what you guys are doing for like projects or research, I'll maybe pull the class at this point. So who would be more interested in um, in predictive models, so thinking more about going along the lines of like machine learning uh, in stats versus who would be more interested in doing uh, like inferential models, so doing more things in the, like in the um, direction of like econometrics uh, and focusing in on, on like getting betas and interpreting um, betas and getting like trying to isolate causality. So maybe think about that for a little bit, and then we'll, we'll vote uh, at the end of class. Or if we're ready now, we could, we could do that. I could even, I could jump around um, for the last bit. OK, all right, so raise your hand if you want to do prediction, and the alternative would be raise your hand if you want to do inference. So prediction, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then uh, inference, one, two, three, four. All right, so machine learning it is. <laughs> Teaching by democracy, okay, cool. So we're we're gonna we're just gonna jump right into it. If this thing will connect, hopefully. Hang on, sorry, one sec. Come on. All right. There we go. Okay. So let's jump on into yeah, the sort of next phase for predictive. So we'll say moving beyond splines plus kernels. So this is like a semi-parametric approach that is functionally flexible. And we saw that especially with the general additive models where we can still let the components uh, be additive and then individual variables can take on nonlinear forms um, versus kernels. Powerful, non-parametric approach for finding decision boundaries. 
Okay, so machine learning. Um, I'm going to put quotes around machine learning because a lot of what we've talked about is already like kind of considered, you know, part of the suite of things that you would do in machine learning. But uh, next logical step. Um, similar in principle to approaches we have already discussed. But in practice, can be a powerful tool to handle scaling. So, If it were for the fact that splines and kernels actually tend to be sort of computationally intensive, especially kernels, um, then you might see those as sort of more commonly employed in fields like machine learning. But one of the really powerful practical aspects of machine learning is that um, it can handle more features. So we're going to like jump into all the machine learning lingo. Um, so they call variables features, or explanatory variables are features. Um, so we'll just go along with that. So if anyone ends up taking like a machine learning class, they'll still know what we're talking about here. And more data. So larger sample size. Larger n, more rows. So one of the big powerful things about these, um, the approaches that we're going to talk about under this sort of machine learning umbrella is, you know, over the last decade and a half or so, the sort of prevalence of these larger and larger data sets and our ability to analyze them really got boosted by this sort of thinking, machine, machine learning and the, and the types of approaches here are like really well suited for being able to handle those in practice. Uh, and so this is going to leverage some of the um, some of the simplicity of what we've learned in linear regression and apply it in certain ways that give us a lot of the flexibility that we see in things like splines and kernels. Okay? Okay, so there are a whole bunch of different terms. Okay, we're just going to do that as we, as we get to them. All right, so what we're going to do um, is to look at a neural network. Okay, and so this is something that you guys may have heard before um, in machine learning lingo. Actually, has anyone taken a machine learning class? Ish, maybe, yeah, okay, you, you did, okay, uh, great. So um, don't worry, we're going to look um, at a more simple example that we're going to sort of replicate just a simple linear regression using a neural network, okay? So let's look at a neural network. So also known as NN example that replicates 
the linear regression. Okay, so we have I1 and I2. going to L, and we have these weights. Okay, so each, whoa, what happened? Each of these, if I were to separate um, sort of columns of uh, these circles, which are uh, known as nodes or perceptrons. So this is a node or perceptron. Um, they're arranged in these layers, which are these columns. Layers, so this is layer one, layer two. And the reason why this is called a neural network is you're building up these sort of neurons that are connected. This is very much uh, analogous to how like real biological neurons uh, operate, right? So you have um, communication between neurons where uh, they communicate from one neuron to another. Uh, sort of in a direct mechanism. That's, that's the inspiration for this. Okay, and so this neural network describes a relationship that I can write out. Okay, and so this would look something like this. So the function is a function of my inputs I1 and I2 and the way this is put together is my weights um, multiplied against my individual input. Uh, so you have W11 coming out of I1. So my input times the weight plus W12I2 is equal to L. What does that look like to you guys? Yes, exactly. So this is just a linear regression. Okay? So we're thinking about this conceptually a little bit different. We're arranging them in this sort of form, and we'll see why this is um, kind of important later, right? This is acting as a building block to more complex neural networks. So my inputs, inputs I, oops, are arranged as tensors. Um, and so what is that? So a scalar is a zero dimension tensor. Uh, a vector is a one-dimensional tensor. Um, matrix is a 2D tensor. And then an array is an n-dimensional tensor. So the tensor describes kind of the structure and arrangement of my input data. OK? Um, so this is a concept that I've touched on before. 
But the way that we solve for betas versus Ws is actually a little bit different, okay? So, oops, beta equals xtx minus 1 xty. So this is a closed form analytical solution. Guaranteed the correct solution and fast in theory. Okay. However, in comparison, weights are obtained by solving numerically. through optimizers such as gradient descent. Not nearly as memory intense, intensive as analytical. can scale effectively and can be applied flexibly. So any functional form. Okay, so I've mentioned this before, but if you are running, if you're attempting to run a linear regression on a really, really large data set, um, you run into problems when you try to calculate your beta. And the reason for that is this matrix right here, right? In a closed form solution, this will instantly solve for your betas, except that an inverse matrix can be highly memory intensive. And so if you try to run a linear regression, that has like a thousand explanatory variables and like 10 million rows, your computer will probably crash, okay? Um, because this operation um, takes too much memory. When you're dealing with smaller data sets, if we're doing things like on a homework or something, right? This will be instantaneous. You're always guaranteed the right solution. Um, but in practice, if you're dealing with the types of problems that machine learning is meant to deal with, doing a gradient descent algorithm will be much, much faster, much more efficient. This will solve for your betas or your weights um, very quickly. And this scales very effectively. So even as your data gets bigger and bigger and bigger, like it, can, it will still rapidly converge to the correct solution. And this is an important nuance, can be applied flexibly. So the betas there, uh, we are specifically talking about linear models. But in fact, we're gonna see that you get these like complicated neural networks um, where our functional form, the final functional form is actually not a linear, uh, oops, is not actually a linear representation of my inputs. Um, and we already saw the problem here, right? So like, if you're solving for betas, you can do it this way for a linear model, but if, if you're doing like a logistic regression, already you have to use like a maximum likelihood estimation, right? This, this form here, this closed solution, only works for, um, only works for linear models. On the other hand, this gradient descent algorithm can be used to solve for weights um, in any functional form uh, or most functional forms. And we'll, we'll see that in, in a little bit. <clears throat>
Okay. So thinking about that like really simple neural network that I drew that right up here, this guy. So this thing as a representation of a linear model, let's take a step back and not think so much about specifically the sort of functional form that it's trying to describe, but like the structure of it, how you essentially have inputs here, you've got layers where every time you move from one layer to another layer, you are doing some kind of transformation, right, through weights, okay? Um, and you could have multiple layers where you have inputs, some like intermediate stuff where like your inputs are feeding into some crazy mess that eventually goes to an output in your final layer, okay? So think more about that type of structure as opposed to like um, just the sort of like linear regression structure, okay? So this, this is mainly to get us familiar with like how neural networks are set up and, and not necessarily focusing specifically on this like um, linear model. So when I think about it from that perspective, um, actually let me just start a new board here. We can now think about a sort of systematic uh, approach to um, to the calculating the weights in these neural networks. Okay, so if I have my input and this goes into a layer where you have some kind of transformation, right? This transformation is informed by a series of weights. So the combination of my inputs and the combination of my weights lets me transform the data in some way uh, that's represented in some other layer. And I could do this uh, again. Right, and, and in this case, maybe I have two Layers, so I have my input layer, I have some kind of random, you know, transform, transformed layer, and then another transformed layer. These also would be informed by a set of weights, a separate set of weights. And eventually, this could go out um, into like my, my output. So these would be my predictions or my y hat. So that's, this is kind of the, the, um, the principle of my neural networks, okay? You have some set of inputs and it goes through some transformations and it arrives at some set of predictions. How do I tell if those predictions are good or not? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> training you guys to, this is um, kind of cross-validation, but, but even, uh, but let's just say we just wanted to calculate the error, right? So not necessary, so cross-validation would be calculating out of sample error. Um, so we have some set of true Ys, and this could be, this very well could be cross-validation. Um, but principally speaking, all we're doing right now is like calculating an error. And so the way that we do that is a comparison of my predictions and my true values through like a loss function. Okay. So there's different types of loss functions. Um, what is one example of um, a loss function? So this might be something like this, where I'm just comparing 
the value of my prediction versus my outcome. And you can use the loss function to give you a score of some kind. And so an example of this could be like a mean squared error, right? Or it could be, you know, if we're talking about like a classification example, this could be my error rate. There's like percent of time that I got it right versus percent of time that I got it wrong, okay? But generically speaking, right, this whole structure is not unique to a linear model. It's not unique to a classifier model. Um, you, this is like the principle uh, of essentially any model that I have, I want it to do well in being able to predict outcomes. And then we're just measuring that, right? So the true power of these kind of approaches is where I can take my loss score and plug it into some kind of optimizer. Okay. And this can iteratively update my weights. So principally speaking, we're kind of doing this in a lot of different ways, right? So um, in cross-validation procedures, you are measuring your out-of-sample mean squared error, and then you're like doing something back in the model to try and reduce your out-of-sample mean squared error as much as possible. We've been doing this like the entire class, right? This structure here describes a generalized approach um, that you can use to basically uh, apply a generalized form of what we've been doing all throughout this class in order to reduce this loss score as much as possible. And the really kind of brilliant thing about this like neural network based approach is that it's sort of like a one shoe fits or one size fits all. Um, as the, the structure of my neural network can take on lots of different variables, it can take on lots of different functional forms, right? Whereas we were separately dealing with linear regression and logistic regression and then doing these like semi-parametric approaches and non-parametric approaches, that's all been sort of generalized into, um, into this form where my doing any one of those things is just dependent on how I kind of set up my neural network, okay? So that's kind of the nice thing about this is it's very sort of generalizable and you can apply it um, in a fairly sort of straightforward way uh, to do a lot of the things that we've already been talking about in, in class. Yeah. Is there a recommended or best practice ratio of the size of the, the true or testing data versus your training data? Like uh, we're going to get into all that. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, how many layers that you should have, how many nodes that you want inside of those layers, um, and then uh, different sort of cross-validation procedures in order to feed your optimizer. It's not going to be too different from the stuff that we've already been doing, actually, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that. Um, Okay, I don't wanna, I think this is a good ending spot and we can dive back into the like linear regression and sort of application of, of this example uh, next time. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I know I said a bunch of administrative stuff at the beginning and again, I will post that in the announcements, but if anyone has any questions or anything about logistics, feel free to Ask, ask now or after class. Okay. Stop.